Thanks everyone for your patience. We're live now. So I will turn it over to the mayor and we'll be starting the meeting in just one moment. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mayor Dave Jaworski. Welcome to the special council meeting of the City of Waterloo, Monday, November 1st, 2021 at 2 p.m. ish in the afternoon. We will begin with a roll call, uh, beginning with Ward 1. Good afternoon, everyone. Councillor Hanmer, present. Councillor Bodily, present. Councillor Veith, present. Councillor Freeman, present. Councillor Henry yeah, present. Can. Very good, thank you. Councillor Bonagall present. And the mayor's here too. Thank you for the roll call. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we are broadcasting from today, and many of us are gathering on, is the land traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge and philosophies of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today. A moment of reflection. At the beginning of this council meeting, we pause to think about the needs of our community. May we show wisdom and compassion in all our decisions. I'll now ask for a disclosure of pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof from any councillors at this time. Hearing none, uh, the first item on the agenda is the minutes of October 4th. Does anybody have any questions or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, I will look to Ward 1, Ward 2 to take us forward, please. Uh, Councillor Hanmer, I'm happy to move the approval of the minutes of our October 4th, 2021 meeting, and I vote in favour. Councillor Bodily, I'll second the minutes and vote in favour as well. Councillor Veith, in favour. Councillor Freeman, in favour. Councillor Henry, in favour. Councillor Bonagor, in favour. And the mayor's in favour too. That carries by all of us for the minutes. Moving on to delegations. Today's a special day when we get to hear from our citizen committees and to get some updates. And first up we have Item A is the Age Friendly Waterloo Multi-Agency Committee update, and uh, presenters include, and not limited to, Jenny Flagler-George, Committee Chair Natalie Barcellos, and Richard Grant. Uh, welcome, Jenny. Thanks very much, Mayor Jaworski. We're really excited to be here today to provide some of the updates on the recent work of the Age Friendly Waterloo Multi-Agency Committee. And for this presentation, we're going to be focusing specifically on exploring some informal university collaborate community collaborations for age friendly communities, noting that the work that you're going to see presented here today from 2 of our student interns, Richard Grant and Natalie Bersolos, um, are really for facilitated from the connection that we foster with uh, the planning department at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and you'll see that this strong collaboration really helps move forward the work of our committee and we greatly benefit from this work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard, who's going to start us off with some of that uh, specific work on the next slide. Hello everyone, we'll be talking about the recent, the recent initiatives for um, AFs for the Age Friendly Waterloo, starting with the addendum to alternatives to long-term 
your report. I'll turn it over to Natalie. She should be. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I will be taking a couple of minutes to discuss the committee's research efforts. Uh, this past winter, the age friendly committee asked graduate students, including myself and Richard uh, from the school of planning to conduct an environmental scan on alternative housing options for older adults. Uh, this work aligned with the committee's 2018 strategic plan, as well as the ongoing committee discussions related to aging and housing. The report includes a collection of case studies of potential housing options for aging, as well as includes some preliminary analysis of what the city of Waterloo may want to consider if they wanted to implement any of these ideas. The main findings from this work um, was the importance of models of housing that allow for older adults to age in a way that is integrated and connected to community. And a copy of this report can be found on the city's website. Next slide, please. So, following the completion of this report, the committee was specifically interested in learning about 1 of the examples in the report uh, called naturally occurring retirement communities or NORCs. NORCs are generally defined as communities that were not planned for older or adults. However, have a high proportion of older adults living in them, as well as have targeted services and programs that support older adults in the community. Over the summer, as an intern, I had the opportunity to work with the committee and prepare an addendum to the initial report that focused specifically on the opportunities of NORCs. The committee was interested in learning more about NORCs because the research is overwhelmingly positive. Research has found that NORC programs improve social interaction and reduce isolation. They have been found to prevent hospital and nursing home stays and saving, in some cases, millions of dollars in public funds. They offer excellent quality of care and have allowed older adults with chronic diseases to remain in their homes longer. And finally, researchers have found that North communities reduce the amount of people moving to long term care. Next slide, please. The addendum includes an action plan that provides a detailed roadmap for what the committee would need to do if they wanted to pursue a NORC program in Waterloo. In addition to the action plan, the addendum also includes a case study of the Cherry Hill NORC in London, Ontario. This NORC program is an award winning program that saw improvements in the overall well being of older adults in London. The committee is in the process of reviewing the addendum and discussing how they may want to use this work to inform their ongoing efforts related to age friendliness in the city of Waterloo. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry. Thanks. So, I would like to transition the discussion um, to some of the programming that the committee has supported, specifically the Aging Well Waterloo directory. This is the second iteration of the directory and the first one being published in 2019. This 2019 directory was very successful and the committee decided to create an updated version of the directory for 2022-2023. The directory is a comprehensive listing of programs, services and amenities that serve the needs of older adults living in Waterloo. The directory is also linked to other city of Waterloo resources, including the social isolation toolkit, which my colleague Richard will discuss momentarily and the City of Waterloo's Older Adult Housing Directory and the City's Program and Activities Guide. An accessible digital version of the guide is available on the City's website. Additionally, 2,000 paper copies will be available for distribution. The publication of the guide was funded in part by advertisements from businesses within the community. The City of Waterloo is also one of the only communities in the province that publishes a comprehensive directory of services and programs for older adults. And based on the feedback of the 2019 directory, we know that this is a valuable resource for older adults in Waterloo. I'd like to pass it off to my colleague Richard now to discuss other age friendly programming initiatives. Next slide, please. The next slide, please. Oh, there we go. The My Wellness Calendar is a 21 month calendar with a built in daily self check in tool. Designed to be a healthy way for older adults to monitor their health and well-being. Each month, the calendar feature is useful information and includes a telephone directory and content contact information to local organizations for additional resources. Next slide, please. The calendar was created through the through the provision of a one-time funding by the City of Waterloo in response to COVID. It was adapted from a calendar that originated in the Wellington Dufferin Guelph region and designed by Dialectic, a company that specializes in workplace science and adult education. My main contribution was adapting the calendar to the city of Waterloo and pairing it for print. The calendar is only available in print form and can be picked up by the city of Waterloo facilities and Waterloo public libraries. In limited copies, there are only a thousand available 
for the on the first first come first serve basis. Next slide, please. The Social Isolation Guide was created to assist older adults in dealing with loneliness and social isolation, filled with information about social support services in the city of Waterloo. Next slide, please. There's also a page specifically for neighbors, friends, and family offering tips on how to support someone who's experiencing social isolation. It is available online at the city of Waterloo facilities. This was not a project that I specifically worked on, however, it was created in partnership with the age-friendly community and the City of Waterloo and would not be possible without the dedication of several important community organizations who contributed to the content, as noted on the logos on the front page. The Waterloo Public Library, the Region of Waterloo Immigration Partnership, and the Kitchener Waterloo Multicultural Center. This project was funded by the Government of Canada through New Horizon for Seniors programs. That's it. Thanks very Thank much, everybody. And uh, we'll take oh. any questions. Excellent, Jenny. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Richard and Natalie. I'll just look for some questions. But in the meantime, uh, certainly uh, thank you uh, all very much for your contributions. And a special shout out to University of Waterloo, especially planning uh, for uh, always being a, a leader with the uh, uh, the grad students on on this team. I think uh, the grad students are, are are literally the reason for our success of Age Friendly Waterloo. That uh, they really show the way forward. And thank you, uh, uh, Richard and uh, Natalie, for for being here today. Um, I will turn over to Councillor Bonagore for a question. Um, thank you. Through you, Mayor Jaworski. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this great information and all your very hard and valuable work. I just had one follow up question. The, when you were talking about the Norks, that really got my um, interest. And I was just wondering, uh, did you identify any that are kind of already existing here in Waterloo? Like, is there a local example we could kind of look at to give us an idea of, of what you're talking about there? Hi, uh, this is Natalie. Um, so, yeah, so one of the things that came out of the action plan in terms of just the, the scope of work that I was able to complete over the summer is so the next step would be doing some of that research around where exactly in Waterloo these NORC communities are. Um, but I think an example, I believe it's the, uh, I stand corrected on the name, but the Waterloo Park Tower. So even like apartment buildings that have high concentrations of people who are over the age of um, either 50 or 65. Um, would be kind of an example of a North community. And then uh, what you, the way the programming would work was that you would create targeted services within that specific community to meet the needs of the seniors who are there. Oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. That was all from me. Thank you, Mayor. No worries. Well, if the, if the bar is over 50, I think Councillor and Hammer and I have a Ward 1 <laughs> as a North community then. Uh, do we have a question? Oh, Councillor Henry, please go ahead. <laughs> that's that's a lot of space out there uh, in in Ward One, then, Mayor. Um, I, I also wanted to pick up on the North. So I think that's very uh, very intriguing, and I know we're doing um, some work on uh, on older adult, uh, you know, strategy around you know recreation programming and support. So the timing is uh, would seem to be well aligned with some of those initiatives. Um, but uh, given your planning students as well, we're also undertaking an, an official plan. Review. I, I'm curious if if the scope of work or or if the work that you've done or the things that you've read have uh, have identified um, any sort of tools in planning that would um, either encourage or inhibit you know NORCs things that we should be thinking of as we're also doing a a, a planning review. This is uh, Natalie here again. So. Um, the, the first thing that I would say is the initial report that was written, and I believe it got posted on the city's website um, early in the summertime. Um, it, we actually went through in great detail for a lot of these, what some um, opportunities and constraints would be for the city if they were to look at implementing them. And one of the examples was of NORCs. I think in terms of 
tools, one of the things that is really exciting, I think, about the NORC opportunity is that it doesn't require physical infrastructure, like the creation of physical infrastructure, and a lot of it is um, around working with communities that already exist and building on the assets that already exist. So in terms of, um, you know, planning tools, I don't know if there are specific things um, that the city could do specifically for NORCs besides thinking about um, identifying where these communities are and then allowing city resources, for example, like accessible transit to really service these areas and support um, older adults within those communities. I think that's that's helpful, and I'm glad there's a, a larger report that's sort of being shared with uh, uh, with the folks that we <laughs> we have working for us that have have expertise in this area. Uh, I suppose one of the things I was thinking about, and I'm curious as to your reaction on it based on your your research, is we we talk a lot about you know aging in in place um, and and all the programs that are sort of required to help somebody uh, in effect retrofit their living environment to suit their changing uh, needs over time. Um, but we we haven't talked as much about aging in neighborhoods uh, in that kind of a way, recognizing that. Um, you know, the housing form and how it's constructed may not be uh, suitable or easily retrofitted, but there could be other spaces in neighborhood. If only we would permit them and allow them and encourage them for people to stay connected to those to those neighborhoods even over time, even if their housing no longer meets their needs, there are other housing options in those neighborhoods. And and then through that lens, looking into into our planning review and how we plan those communities. That's where my head was at. So I, I'm curious if. Uh, if you have any particular reaction to that, otherwise it's just a comment into the ether, which is fine by me too. I think that uh, what you said uh, really resonates. And I think in that initial report that we conducted, we talked about a framework called aging in community, which is about this idea of um, creating housing for seniors. Um, and, you know, in, in terms of the design features that allows them to stay integrated into their community and or allowing the zoning to reflect housing that is connected to community. So not being zoned so far outside the city that is no longer connected to resources and amenities. Um, so these specific, you know, housing that's oriented towards aging being zoned in places that is really um, well integrated into other aspects of community life. So I think that would be one thing that would really, I think, Norks is a is an avenue for doing that, and then I would say that in that initial report we did, we really went into detail and we actually looked at some of the city's policy and cre created some areas that might be worth considering or reviewing to better allow for older adult housing. Thanks, that's uh, that's that's very helpful. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Henry. Over to Councillor Veith, please. I thank you through you, Mayor Jaworski. Thanks for this uh, really interesting report, everybody. Um, I'm a little, I'm interested in the wellness calendar. You said there's a thousand that were on they're only printed and they're only available at city um, facilities. It makes me think about um, that maybe that's like, uh, maybe they should be other places because like doctors maybe or um, community centers. Can you just elaborate a bit on the calendar for me? Thanks. Um, Richard here, I can elaborate on the calendar for a bit. So the reason why there's only such a limited supply deals first with funding. And we're also trying to figure out the best places it could be. And initially the city of Waterloo facilities and public libraries are just the first choice. But I do agree that a wider distribution would be more helpful. I think in the future, in terms of where this could go, we could, you know, have other places where people are more likely to be like the pharmacy or, you know, maybe a bank or other places that older adults visit. Um, okay, I just was, I had a follow up, but I forget what it is now. Um, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank um, you for the answer. <laughs> yeah, we're also focusing on for in the future trying to get the calendar to be also online, but that's next steps. Right. Um, and do people just come across it? Is that the idea? Like, how do how do older adults find it or know about it? Are they they happen to be in the library? Or they happen to be, um, you know, in a, you know, where the two places where or the few places where they are. 
So I would say that we're definitely hoping that folks will come across it where they are, but it was also part of the recent um, communication announcing the availability of, re of these resources. So uh, hopefully um, a few places, including word of mouth. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Reese, and I will add that uh, the Age Friendly Waterloo team did get a message from uh, uh, team member Rick Chambers and uh, just a few hours ago, and that he dropped off copies of the directory at a local pharmacy and church and uh, and uh, leaving the aging, uh, Age Friendly uh, Aging Well directory as well as a wellness calendar. So that's uh, something, uh, food for thought, I think, for us as councillors to uh, uh, consider uh, getting some and putting them in our our local uh, uh, areas in our own wards. Um, I'll turn over to Councillor Hammer. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I was just going to comment on that because I was aware that Rick had had distributed it to other locations. And I also wanted to add that um, through the sessions, the uh, workshop sessions that they've been running with Age Friendly Waterloo and Age Friendly Waterloo Region, a lot of this information is promoted to the seniors and it's beyond, it's seniors beyond our community. Um, I had the privilege of participating in one of their sessions not, not long ago exactly on this topic of housing and aging in community. And uh, yes, back to you, Mayor, Ward 1 does have a number of NORCs already in existence and they were proudly talking about them during these uh, during these sessions. So um, it's uh, the report, certainly Jenny, Natalie and Gr and Richard, thanks so much for putting it together because it really is starting to generate a buzz of conversation among the seniors in our community. And I think there's a, a big appetite in how we can look at in our planning um, making sure that we are creating age-friendly communities and multi-generational communities as well. So thank you for all your efforts. Thank you, Councilor Hammer, and I see no further questions or comments, but I'll let my ones at the uh, the beginning stand. Thank you very much to the Age Friendly Waterloo entire team, and uh, thank you for the report, Jenny and Natalie and Richard. I'll, and I'll see you at the next meeting. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Uh, next up. Let's invite in, uh, oh, uh, it's the Town & Gown Multi-Agency Committee is presenting. Uh, James Craig, the chair, unfortunately could not be with us due to a last minute change uh, today. And so instead, uh, Commissioner Mark Dykstra is going to take the reins of PowerPoint today. Welcome, Mark. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. All right, uh, Mayor and Council, on behalf of James Craig and the entire Town & Gown Multi-Agency Committee, thank you for uh, enabling us to present today. Next slide, please. The uh, key focuses of today's uh, update is just around uh, our mandate, speak to those who are participating, uh, share some uh, highlights that uh, we have achieved in the last uh, term here, and a little bit of more uh, focus on our working committees, as noted, their accommodations for students, large street gatherings, and community cohesion. Next slide, please. Just to share an update on the uh, mandate, as noted there, it's really around the uh, relationship uh, building between, uh, you know, the, the community members, uh, our students and uh, our institutions here. They bring such a, a value to our community and really around then addressing uh, areas of concern, whether it is around neighborhood development, housing, environment, uh, volunteer programs. Uh, record and culture as well as health matters and you'll see that in some of the work that the committee subcommittees are doing next slide please a large uh, working group that comes together and also uh, uh, steering committee too but overall we have uh, the institutional representation uh, both on the uh, administrative side and the student union student leaders and uh, great dynamics uh, amongst uh, the inputs from all of those institutions as well as uh, regional police are part of this and the uh, input from uh, residents at large and uh, currently recruiting some new members there, but it's been a, a great conversation with uh, all of those uh, folks, including Councillor Hamner. Uh, thank you for her support as we've uh, worked through a number of issues and her support uh, uh, on those uh, various subcommittees. Next slide, please. 
Just uh, looking at some uh, accomplishments here, the uh, terms of reference have uh, been reviewed by the committee, uh, more administrative in nature, to uh, get all the current titles, uh, just some procedural piece that uh, are represented of uh, uh, how we do and how we best manage our, the work uh, that we do. Next slide, please. Another key highlight for us uh, in June was a number of us participating in the Town and Gown uh, Association of Ontario, their co conference. And we had a great opportunity from uh, administrative point of view, student point of view, uh, resident point of view, and myself even, just to uh, elaborate on the work that the local Town and Gown Committee uh, is doing here in Waterloo. Some of the uh, the uh, reports we've submitted to council, some of the challenges that we maybe have, issues that we're addressing. We had a, a great discussion with uh, other members uh, that have town and gown associations. Next slide, please. The third bullet there, collaboration on return to campus, really speaks to uh, the last year and a half as we've uh, dealt with uh, COVID uh, response. And then, uh, you know, this term trying to uh, support the institutions as they've gotten back into campus and what that would look like and how we would welcome uh, students uh, that are, whether remote or on campus, are doing their studies. So that uh, has been a good discussion around the committee and some actionable items as we've uh, done different uh, outreach reaches that'll speak to you momentarily. Also uh, getting into the subcommittee work now, uh, a couple of key points I want to uh, focus on uh, in terms of student accommodation, large street gathering and the cohesion subcommittee. Next slide, please. With respect to the student accommodation report, housing is key. Understanding the accommodation uh, supply and demand has, has been a key uh, uh, report in the past and that ongoing work uh, was continued when uh, we thought it would be good to bring together the, uh, the, the, the previous team. Uh, reps from all those different agencies that I met to just see where what are the next steps. And the, uh, as noted, uh, student accommodation study typically contains uh, an understanding of the uh, accommodation study, the supply and demand, and then also a student uh, survey, uh, an in-depth student survey that uh, gives a perspective, uh, perspective as well. Uh, through that uh, discussion too, some uh, other items had been uh, identified and we thought were important to have a discussion on. And, and just uh, sub-point uh, within that last minute bullet, just want to emphasize areas that we, we thought we should be looking at. Is there a, a shortage of supply? Rental affordability is key, just uh, seeing that growth uh, ongoing. The need for more short term options uh, has been a discussion point and uh, concern with landlord work orders and responses delays have been heightened in the past and then education on the tenant rights and, and for example key and damage deposit and overall quality of accommodation uh, inventory so some uh, work amongst the student associations has been great uh, at that time personally attending some sessions where uh, education on tenant rights and that were, were well received by the uh, the student uh, population our municipal enforcement staff joined in uh, on that and, and other uh, technical experts as well also some uh, work done uh, on that front. Next slide, please. Due to COVID, of course, consensus was to focus on the uh, the change in supply. So really drilled down on that aspect versus going out to a, a student uh, survey. So uh, James Craig, uh, not here today, but has done a, a great job in leading some landlord surveys uh, on uh, this issue, surveys on the different classes as well. So with regards to uh, next deck, steps, uh, uh, reporting back the subcommittee to the uh, broader town and gown committee, just recognize the need to, uh, as Conestoga College grows just to uh, uh, assess the catchment area and uh, moving that out towards the expressway more. Uh, and then uh, also uh, as COVID uh, restriction ease, uh, the uh, committee will regroup on the main remaining items. Uh, what's the best time to have the survey? What's, uh, what else should we be including there on those previous uh, bullet subsets that I noted? So that's a student accommodation report. Next slide, please. Some great work uh, prior to uh, uh, COVID was back in March of 2020, uh, the outcomes of the large street gathering report, uh, some uh, uh, large work by the uh, task force and um, 
uh, the partners uh, as noted, but just uh, as a reminder for council and the public, just some key uh, recommendations there, operational excellence uh, to change the nature of the event. Three, institutional culture. Four, student solutions. Five, reduce the financial burden. Six, advocacy. Next slide, please. And then seven, legislative improvements. Change the built form, landlord education, comprehensive communication plan, ongoing collaboration and measuring outcomes. Next slide. The, uh, uh, the recommendations uh, and sort of next steps were, were paused for about a year, year and a couple of months while uh, COVID advanced and we responded to uh, any issues on the street in a, uh, in a manner that uh, recognized the, the state of the pandemic. But it was felt to uh, engage uh, the, the Town and Gown Committee to say, what are the focus areas next? Uh, how do we implement uh, this? Uh, this report and it's not on the shelf, but it becomes a living document and we move forward on the implementation. So a subcommittee has been uh, set and working with a, a lead student rep, a WLU rep, U of W rep, a, a community rep, as well as a Waterloo P police superintendent, myself and our director of municipal enforcement and really moving forward on five key uh, areas. And I'd like to speak to those. So next slide, please. Just looking at our key number one uh, point is a comp free, comprehensive uh, communication plan and really speaks to peer-to-peer uh, -peer messaging that we want to advance and that's the, the crux of uh, this entire issue of large street gatherings we believe and the uh, challenges with them and why you know we have to bring a, an end to them and uh, that's where we've uh, advancing this uh, recommendation with uh, some support from a uh, communication agency we've uh, as partner key partner collaborators funding that and moving that forward aim to uh, have a, a learn listen type of approach right now and then a plan and then an implement uh, strategy with this communication plan with some uh, messaging target uh, targeted for uh, March of 2020. 22 and really those messaging continue messages continuing to focus on you know the health health care the wellness of individuals public safety and the uh, the impacts of these type of events next slide institutional culture there just uh, just looking at how the institutions uh, play a role in this and just looking at different things without and within that hitting uh, non academics uh, code of conduct how does that uh, play into this uh, recruitment uh, focus I know homecoming uh, did a, a homecoming uh, pl sorry WLU did a homecoming plan and uh, just looking at, hey, how's that uh, been uh, implemented and considered and overall messaging uh, around how do you enjoy uh, the, uh, the student life and how does that fit into your academic uh, life as well as a student. Next slide. Speaks to you, uh, student solutions, and really, you know, students drive uh, outcomes here with this entire problem statement, and we want to continue to look at student solutions and support that. Whether it's our current work with City Studio, uh, MBA courses, and thoughts around, well, what's the carbon impact of such uh, events like this? What else can be done with, uh, you know, the funding that we're providing for these uh, these uh, operational plans? Can they go to support student needs as well? So, uh, some thoughts around that. Next slide. Uh, legislative improvement and this is where the city uh, gets involved uh, also with uh, Waterloo Regional Police but just uh, looking at uh, where we can lobby uh, through uh, AMO which is the Association of Municipalities of Ontario uh, large urban mayors caucus as well other communities have similar issues and how can we uh, join together to help support uh, each other moving forward I know uh, some discussion um, as well with uh, items such as party registry, community safety zones, how can those be uh, rolled out? And uh, I know Waterloo Regional Police are looking at this amongst their peers as well. And the last uh, bullet on this item, next slide, please. Just uh, wants uh, speaking to uh, measuring outcomes and we feel even this update to uh, council is a key part of that, but also want to uh, research some uh, uh, academic support in this manner to see how we're doing. So that's that uh, subcommittee work. Want to focus on the last area, community cohesion. Next slide, please. 
And this is uh, really speaks to how we connect uh, those that are coming uh, to this to our community with uh, the existing community and having that, uh, you know, as it says, cohesion, that connectedness, uh, maybe that glue that how do we uh, move forward uh, with one another living in our community and some uh, great work from our neighborhood team builds on the neighborhood uh, strategy, but one area, a couple areas where they're focusing and leading this uh, subcommittee work just on uh, a toolkit of uh, good landlord tenant relations. What does that look like? Creating uh, connections in multi residential units. And, you know, we have some great neighborhood associations amongst some of our single family, uh, et cetera. How do we go beyond that uh, into some of the townhouse blocks and even our high rise uh, uh, buildings as well? So into the vertical as well. And also focusing on the new to Waterloo and sharing those, hey, places to go, places to visit. Uh, some of the uh, support systems in the community as well. So that's uh, what the, the community cohesions uh, uh, group is working on. Next slide, uh, please. As well as just uh, trying to engage uh, those in our community through new methods. What are the best methods? Well, whether it's uh, WeChat or our uh, website and how can we uh, expand that and so some microsite uh, experience testing there. Uh, a great focus this fall has been on Instagram launch through the neighborhood group to reach out to students and it's been a, a great tool and I know some of council has participated on some Instagram reels uh, watching those and uh, uh, following that have been great so thanks to all for that and uh, just wrapping up here next slide please. Just want to uh, acknowledge uh, bylaw education campaign too within the community uh, cohesion group and uh, we're, uh, we specifically focused on renters, but I know uh, outreach from bylaw has been great at attending some uh, orientation events, so appreciate that. So those are the key highlights. Next slide, please, from uh, the Town and Gown Committee uh, on behalf of uh, James Craig. I know he'd uh, extend a thanks to the the members of the committee and staff who are supporting the uh, subcommittee and the opportunity to present before council tonight as well. So uh, back to you, Mayor. Thanks for the opportunity to present to yourself and council. Yeah, and thank you, Mark, for stepping in for uh, uh, James as as he's away. Um, I'll just look to uh, any uh, questions from council. And I will turn over to Councillor Hammer. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks very much uh, through you, Mayor. Um, Commissioner Dykstra, thanks so much for presenting on behalf of the, the committee. There's been a lot of great work done over the last couple of years. Uh, no small feat. Uh, you've, you've been instrumental also in providing leadership to the group and, and in also helping to encourage the participation from the group. So um, it's, been a, it's been a very, um, enlightening opportunity to see so many students getting involved, the student leadership, it's been great. And I think a lot of good initiatives are well underway. So um, just for the minutes to also express thanks to James Craig, who's been our fearless chair for the last number of years. Thank you. And um, oh, Councillor Henry, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and thanks, Mark, for uh, uh, for stepping into uh, to the PowerPoint uh, presentation here. Going back to the beginning and the sort of student accommodation support piece, I'd note the last time we had an an actual update on sort of a fulsome report pre-COVID, um, yeah, the 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 talk around the council table of the council at the time and out in the media was around, oh my goodness, there is way too much housing, and so I, I note with with interest the uh, the bullet points that were being discussed around town and gown now is is there enough housing uh, and, and so it, it's it's always fascinating to watch how how the conversation ebbs and uh, ebbs and flows over over time i what i couldn't get from the presentation was to understand um, if if the sort of supply demand work did happen i know the survey part hasn't and other aspects you're coming back to but it did sound like there was some work on the on the sort of question of of supply that was being done. I was wondering if you could help me pinpoint exactly uh, where we are on that. If we know anything new, if we've completed any of that work, or if that's still ongoing. Yeah, uh, thank you, three mayor to council Hen Henry. So uh, some informal uh, supply uh, work was done by James, and, and we've got a good handle on on that. Uh, some other inputs from. Uh, uh, on the, the student piece, 
is really around uh, understanding what's available still with the the current policies within the university you know with respect to COVID. so i would say uh, still a work in progress. Uh, when we have something to share, we will share it, but uh, uh, they're within the working committee. They've got a sense, but I uh, want to fine tune that a little bit more. want to get some information on uh, the enrollment piece and, and supporting that the next conversation before we report back. So work in progress, more to come when it's available, Councillor. I uh, appreciate that. I, I've been I've been generally when when asked saying something similar that we've, we've got some work to do and COVID has thrown a wrench in all of the numbers on all sides of the equation. And, and so it's taking us some some time. I just wanted to make sure that if I kept giving that answer until I heard differently, it would be the right answer. So uh, it sounds like it. So so thanks, Mark. Thank you. And thank you very much. I don't see any further questions and thank you for Council Hanmer for thanking the uh, uh, the committee. Uh, with that, I'm going to move on to the Arts and Culture Committee update uh, with Abby Simpson uh, as well as Janet Seely, and we'll just wait for them to come in. And I will turn it over to Abby. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you can hear me okay, I assume. You sound great, Abby. Thanks so much. All right, so my name is Abby, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a student at the University of Waterloo, a student resource member on this committee and the vice chair of the Advisory Committee on Culture. So today's pre presentation is a collaborative effort of the Advisory Committee on Culture. And I'd like to first start by introducing the members of the Advisory Committee who were unable to attend today. So that's Andrea Little, Chiazor, Uwogo, uh, Alvin Suzer, uh, Heather Franklin, Janet Seely, Margaret Mutamba, Rima Masri, Max Salmon, Samred, Adibi, Shelly Carey, and Tani Hippel, Dennis Longchamp, and Anisha Sheen. So thank you for the opportunity to present today on behalf of everybody on the committee. Um, next slide, please. The City of Waterloo has committed to supporting the vibrant and resilient culture sector and recognizes the contributions of this sector to both the economic and to both economic and community development. Understanding community issues and ensuring that the sector is well represented in the city's initiatives is an important role of this committee. To do this, we invite community organizations to participate in our meetings as presenters. We meet annually with the culture advisory committees uh, from other regional municipalities and provide feedback on projects and strategies that impact the local culture sector. The advisory committee on culture has identified uh, three pillars from the new strategic plan as focus for committee activity for 2021-2022, all three pillars selected complement the goals outlined in Waterloo's culture plan. Next slide, please. The committee recognizes the importance of engaging and celebrating diverse communities. Our committee regularly provides feedback to staff to encourage further communication with cultural communities across the region and discusses ways to ensure communities have access, uh, including physical access to city programming. On the screen, you see here a photo from the Happiness Project a number of our committee members contributed stories to this project, and the committee also provided support in sharing information throughout our networks to encourage story sharing and engagement in this project as well. Next slide. Culture is a core dimension of vibrant and sustainable communities. By nurturing community networks, supportive innovative thinking, and contributing to great public spaces, the Advisory Committee on Culture is helping to build a great community. Some of these functions operate in the Public Art Committee, a standing committee of the Advisory Committee on Culture, and they do a lot of work to bring artists to our community and provide them with opportunities. Uh, this on the screen is one of the artists we have worked with in the Community Table Program. A member of our committee was a jury member for the Picnic Table Program and helped select these artists. Next slide. By connecting with local artists and organizations and by raising awareness of city-led programs and economic opportunities, the committee supports the work of the city's economic development division and helps strengthen our local economy. Our committee has spent a lot of time communicating with our networks. 
We have spread the word to say about these opportunities and ensure more artists have eyes on the programs that the city has to offer and uh, have access to our artist resources and open calls. We recently supported an open call for artists for a new installation in Waterloo Park. Next slide. Affordable spaces, including housing, has been identified as a key issue by this committee. Artists are being driven out of Waterloo due to housing prices and lack of available studio space. As a result, the arts and culture in Waterloo is at risk of disappearing. The crisis is further amplified due to Waterloo's lack of room to grow and sprawl. The committee provided feedback to the planning staff on a, the affordable housing plan. We further discussed the following key points as important for council to keep in mind. So live work studios are affordable spaces for artists to live and create while contributing to arts in Waterloo. Arts incubators and accelerator programs. So as a region, we focus on the tech industry and using approaches to encourage more tech. Um, we could use similar strategies to encourage our art scene and support local artists in the city. So art and creative residences, residency programs could support the city with a stream of new talent and, pers and perspectives to contribute to our culture. Uh, next slide, please. So studio share initiatives. We could connect artists to share studio space and alleviate financial costs for artists. And then finally, cultural districts. Waterloo could cultivate a special arts district a place, uh, and place the same level of importance as it does on the tech sector. This could attract tourists and be a focal point for visitors and current residents to enjoy even furthering the economic development goals of the city. Uh, next slide, please. This slide indicates our key initiatives for 2022, including advocating for affordable art spaces and housing, um, supporting development of the Amplify Cultural Summit, uh, support local programming of Creative City Network Summit, uh, assist with the development of the culture plan and assist with the implementation of a culture sector COVID-19 assessment on impacts and recovery needs. Uh, you'll also see on this slide a photo of uh, the Trail Mix music stop on Fourwell Trail. Members of our committee have provided input into this program as well. Uh, last slide, please. Uh, this brings us to the end of the presentation. I'll happily take any questions and thank you again for the opportunity to present on behalf of the Advisory Committee on Culture. Thank you, Abby, for taking the lead on that and helping out uh, in your chairing of uh, some past meetings there. More, certainly much appreciated. Uh, Councillor Vasek uh, 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 couldn't be with us this afternoon, but uh, when I was stepping in for her on the Arts and Culture Committee as well as Heritage, I know she was she was very excited as, uh, to come back and be sitting on those. So I know how much she uh, cares about the uh, Arts and Culture Committee and uh, has a lot of good thought. And uh, thank you for the uh, layout of the presentation as well in terms of very, very, very much structured towards our own council strategic plan and city strategic plan. I'll look to councillors to see if they have any questions for Abby. Seeing, oh, seeing one, Councillor Bonagor, please go ahead. Um, hi, thank you through you, Mayor Jaworski. Um, thank you for all of your work that you've been doing. Um, I was just really wondering about the, the discussions within the, the committee and whether you ever look kind of at the city itself to see if there are ways that city processes can be simplified for artists uh, and just to looking internally for improvements that, that could help the art in the artist community kind of survive and thrive. So do I just respond directly or? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Abby. Oh, thank, uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, so we've occasionally had discussions about um, some feedback from our committee members um, about uh, making it easier for um, members of our communities to uh, engage in our programming. I believe I um, briefly touched on uh, the ways that our, commu our committee members have uh, provided feedback to uh, city staff. Um, we don't necessarily uh, have that structured into our meetings, but it does occasionally come up and our uh, staff resource member um, takes that feedback 
um, and provides us with updates on uh, implementation and things like that, if, if that's helpful. It, it's really helpful. No, it's, I'm really glad to hear it. Uh, and thank you very much for, for all of the information today. Thanks, Mayor. That's all from me. Thank you, Councillor. And I see that was the, uh, the only question for Abby. So thank you very much. And I will see you again in the future, Abby. Thank you. Um, now on to item D, uh, the Municipal Heritage Committee update with Nicholas Lawler. Let's bring in Nicholas. Rick, you may need to unmute Nicholas for the first time. One second. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can now. Please go ahead. Great. There we go. Uh, thank you everyone for having me. I'll give my annual uh, update on the Municipal Heritage Committee. Uh, coming. So next slide. Uh, so first I'd like to acknowledge that the land we're gathering today is the land traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. And I'd like to uh, recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening the community and, and thank them for their stewardship. Um, and the, the city of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman track, a land promised to six nations that includes 10 kilometers each side of the Grand River. And I know we did this at the start, but uh, for the Heritage Committee, uh, we always like to focus our thoughts on, on this uh, sorts of thing when we when we meet, because there's a tendency as, uh, as you know, colonial people to kind of think our history began in, you know, 18 something, uh, but the, the history of this land goes back much, much further than that. And uh, we always want to remember that we're we're talking about the heritage of this region. It's it's an ever stretching heritage, not just uh, a, sh a short time that uh, people like us have been here. So that's uh, something we do at the beginning of each of our meetings. Uh, next slide. Um, so I, I I won't go and read these again, but uh, we we do have terms of of reference that we follow. And 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 one of the biggest things here is that uh, council is asking us as a committee to. Kind of inform the, inform them their decisions on on the heritage within the region and the city, and uh, it's it's part of the Ontario Heritage Act. So we we are required to exist, and uh, council is required to at least listen to us, not necessarily follow our recommendations. Uh, next slide. Uh, so committee, uh, I'm here's a little summary. Uh, I'm the, I'm the chair. Uh, Philip Ellsworthy is, is the vice chair, and we have um, Michelle Lee and Dominic Simpson uh, support for staff, and and as mentioned, uh, Councilor Vasek is uh, the, the council member. And we have our other, other members uh, as well. Uh, next slides. Um, so along with uh, the rest of the world, we uh, became virtual in uh, 2020, and we didn't get to do this update last year just because of how everything was going. So uh, back again <laughs> to do this. Uh, a lot of our work, of course, is in the field, uh, doing property surveys and and uh, doing uh, primary research in things like uh, institutions and the. Uh, the land registry office, so that became a lot more difficult given the ongoing pandemic. Um, the other stressor on the committee was the fact that construction activities uh, increased greatly because people were at home and wanting to renovate their their homes, which uh, increased the amount of heritage permits we had, and uh, also with this, this the, the, the high level of real estate activity in the city uh, that made uh, a lot of work happening with people. Uh, leveraging equity in their homes and, and developers doing work. So it, it's been a, a very intense, uh, I'd say, five or 10 years. And uh, the last year, two years have been especially intense. Next slide. Uh, so one of the uh, biggest thing we did, we've done in the last year is uh, the EV farmhouse at Waterloo Park uh, was protected under part four of the Heritage Act. Uh, so council, I believe, passed that. I want to say November of last year. Um, and uh, next slide, you can show a, a photo of it if you don't remember. Um, this is the uh, the farmhouse. So originally, of course, Wilder Park was a farm, and uh, then eventually, when the city obtained the, uh, the the farmland and created the park, this is where the park warden uh, caretaker lived with his family. And uh, so we have a lot of uh, really cool photos of it going back in time, and uh, lots of neat history about this particular building. Uh, currently, it's used by the Wilder Potters. Uh, Guild and uh, I believe the intent is for them to stay in, in this uh, this building for a longer period. So it does need some work, um, but it is a, a kind of a cool little gem of the park, and it's kind of hidden away within some brush. So um, I think there's been some talk of maybe uh, starting to kind of make it a little more, you know, focal point of the park as the the world of the park is changing. So it was great to get this on the designated bylaw because uh, now it kind of gives us some bumpers of how it will, it will change uh, going forward. Next slide. 
Uh, so the committee uh, reviews a lot of documents and planning initiatives that uh, that happen uh, as part of our work. And so I'll just give a quick little summary on the next slide. So, of course, uh, the city owned button factory and Carnegie library, uh, there's been some activities there with some renovations and improvements with accessibility. Um, there's been some private developments such as uh, 120 King and the Rudy Snyder house, which is a designated property in the Westville area. Uh, so those, there's some um, uh, new single family dwellings being built around the Rudy Snyder house, which we were a part of and uh, 36 urban 120 King are redevelopments with uh, multi res multi level buildings going up that will affect uh, listed properties uh, being uh, demolished or improved. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is a quick summary. So there was uh, 24 total uh, kind of heritage permits that came through. There's 13 in 2020 and, thir th and 13 so far. I think it's actually supposed to be uh, 12 so far. And uh, they have some varying levels of complexity that we, we kind of deal with. And uh, because of that complexity and kind of the nature of, of how this goes, uh, council delegated some approval authority down to staff and uh, the committee. So out of those 24, actually 21 were approved through the delegated process, which means it didn't have to come through council, uh, which made it uh, a lot quicker for, for residences and uh, kind of cleaned up your plate a little bit. So uh, that process has been working really, really well. Um, it's, it's been able, things have been streamlined a lot better. And if somebody comes with a heritage permit that kind of conforms to what the expectations are, it's pushed through almost immediately. So it, I think it's made a uh, the people wanting to get heritage permits and do things the right way. It kind of pushes in that direction. So it's been a really great great success in the last in the last five years. Uh, next slide. Um, so we're doing other stuff too, of course. So uh, as mentioned before, the official plan is being updated. So we're involved in that. Um, there is uh, going to be a Heritage plaque uh, at the Bauer Apartments, um, which is uh, 168 King Street South. And there's other things going on within the Heritage Grant program. Um, and then uh, kind of a cool, unique thing in Ontario is uh, the potential designation of a mature elm tree in the, uh, the east side of the city. So uh, that's not done very often on the Ontario Heritage Act, but we're currently reviewing it with, uh, with staff. I believe that's it. Now, answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, for the uh, presentation. I'll just look to councillors for questions. Seeing none, uh, again, I'd like to reiterate uh, Councillor Vasek, and I know her strong interest in this committee, and I, I've been pleased to, to sit in on it for the past couple of uh, uh, months and uh, to see the good work that the uh, that the team does, and thank you for your for your leadership and for um, uh, participating here today, Nicholas. My brother, thank you, sir. Thank you. With that, we move on to the uh, consent motion, and there's the committee night annual report, also the East Side Branch Library public art, as well as the fireworks bylaw update. I'll just pause to see if anybody has any. Uh, questions that they'd like to pull those for questions. Seeing none, I will look to Ward 1, Ward 2 to consider moving the consent item. Councillor Hanmer, I'm happy to move the consent motion and vote in favour. Councillor Bodley, I will second the consent motion and vote in favour. Councillor Veith, vote in favour. Councillor Freeman in favor. Councillor Henry in favor. Councillor Bonagor in favor. And the mayor's in favor too. Thank you very much, Kevin, for the community night annual report. Nicole for the fireworks bylaw update. And uh, to Sonia Nestero, certainly very excited. I think everyone will be to see the uh, Eastside Branch Library Public Art. And thank you to the uh, jury for its efforts in that. That's uh, Another exciting move forward for our long awaited East Side Branch Library. Um, moving on to item 11, which is staff reports. And these are uh, potentially combinations of presentations and reports from our committees. Uh, first up, item A is the Waterloo Park Advisory Committee, Autumn 2021 update. And uh, uh, Gordon, uh, Gordon is here as well to uh, 
to delegate on the uh, report. So thank you very much for the report and as well for presenting here today, Gordon. My pleasure. Good afternoon, Mayor Jaworski and the members of uh, the Waterloo Council. Um, as mentioned, I'm Gordon Gravatt. I'm the chair of the uh, Waterloo Park Advisory Committee. And on behalf of all of the members of uh, WPAC, I'm pleased to be with you today to discuss the exciting projects that are underway in the park and to emphasize WPAC's continued support for improvement to the park as is outlined in the master plan. At the outset, I want to both acknowledge and thank Council for its continuing support of the impl implementation of the Waterloo Park Master Plan. I also want to mention that uh, because construction has been, uh, the construction projects have been such a major activity recently within the park, uh, many of the photos uh, that I'm uh, using uh, and featuring today uh, cover the uh, completed or some of the ongoing construction projects. Next slide, please. Both 2020 and 2021 have really been years of expanded opportunity for Waterloo Park. Um, as, I out, as I outlined uh, when we last met in mid-January, um, and I want to re-emphasize now, the pandemic restrictions uh, as a result of that, new visitors have explored and enjoyed the park while the uh, past visitors have continued to come and use the park and potentially use it a bit differently. Uh, generally, I believe it's safe to say that um, people have gained a greater appreciation for the value of green spaces uh, given the pandemic restrictions, especially its positive effect on both mental and physical health. The need for many folks to connect with nature has been reinforced. As some city amenities start to reopen, uh, even if still only in a somewhat limited capacity, the WPAC members, the city staff, and some council members continue to receive messages of appreciation for the availability, the accessibility, and the upkeep of uh, the city parks and other open spaces uh, during this pandemic period. Waterloo City Parks have been busy throughout the entire period, and this observation is certainly true for Waterloo Park. We anticipate that this uh, heavy use of parks and open spaces will continue as we uh, move towards post-pandemic new normal. Next slide, please. At this point, um, I'd like to uh, review a couple of the uh, uh, park improvements that have occurred or may even be continuing uh, to occur, um, especially over the past two years. The major project has been the rehabilitation of um, both the Laurel Creek uh, through the park and of Silver Lake itself. This work um, has now been completed and recent landscaping and paving of the uh, South Shore walkway uh, around the Perimeter Institute um, means that the uh, re reconfigured shoreline along this side of the, uh, of the lake uh, will soon be open to park visitors. Uh, when the ongoing project to terrace the north shore of Silver Lake is completed within the next year, this entirely renewed significant uh, water feature will provide a new aesthetically pleasing enhancement to this area of the park. Next slide, please. Completion of the water play area uh, last year uh, behind the skate park on the Father David Bauer Drive uh, with its uh, shaded seating area, its public washroom and change facilities was very much enjoyed by many families during this past summer. Over the next year, uh, we anticipate that the enhancement to the uh, wayfinding signage and the improvement of the uh, Bauer lot, along with the completion of the first segment of the internal park circuit pathway, uh, which in will include an additional pedestrian bridge across Laurel Creek and providing better access to the growing uh, hub of outdoor activities immediately across from the Memorial Recreation Center will offer further improvements and will in fact uh, augment the soon to be uh, completed indoor facilities that are currently nearing completion at the uh, Rec Recreation Center. Next slide, please. As a volunteer advisory committee, the, the citizens who are on it um, and the, the as members of, the, of this committee, we're pleased not only uh, with the recent completed projects, 
but are also uh, enthusiastic about the future projects, which will continue to make Waterloo Park a great place for the residents of Waterloo and for the visitors to our city, uh, especially when considering that the continuing level of uh, pandemic restrictions and the anticipated future of the new normal, as many people uh, are calling it, um, continues to evolve. WPAC will continue its efforts to support the city as uh, these priority projects are implemented. This is actually a very exciting time to be involved with these projects and with the park, even if uh, only in advisory capacity. And we believe that these upcoming projects will, not, uh, will continue uh, to enhance this jewel in the center of our great city. We would like to sincerely thank the council for their continued support of these projects that are directly related to Waterloo Park and the implementation of the Waterloo Master Plan. Uh, we also want to thank the many members uh, of your city staff uh, for their efforts to guide over and oversee the design and implementation of these Waterloo Park improvement projects. Next slide, please. So I want to thank you uh, this afternoon um, for your time and I welcome any questions that you may have. Excellent, thank you very much, Gordon. Certainly, yeah, the Waterloo Park being the jewel and a very much shinier jewel in the coming months and years. So thank you very much for that. I'll just look to council to see if there's any questions or for the committee councillor. And I will turn over to Councillor Bonagor. Please go ahead. Uh, through you, Mayor Jaworski, thank you, Gordon, for coming and giving everyone the overview of the many varied and interesting discussions that are ha had on this committee. Uh, I know the, the members really put a lot of heart and soul into the discussions um, and they, they try to bring a lot of different perspectives, which is really, really valuable. And I also want to give a shout out to the, the Friends of Waterloo Park Committee who are also so dedicated to the park and finding ways to kind of keep this community gem just really thriving. So thank you for coming today, Gordon, and my thanks to the whole committee and people who were on the committee kind of leading up to this as well, because a lot of this work is ongoing. So it's kind of passing the baton, if you will. Um, but thank you to them. Thank you to you as well. My pleasure and everybody else's pleasure who's on the committee as well, I'm sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Gordon, for representing the uh, committee as chair. Thank you. Moving on to item B, it's the Sustainability uh, Advisory Committee and a report uh, or presentation by Matt Thiessen, Chair. And uh, I think we might also have Lucas and John with us as well. Wonderful, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, and unfortunately, Lucas wasn't able to join today uh, due to a last minute cancellation, but uh, John is with us as well. Uh, John, you wanna just confirm you there? I'm not Sorry, sure uh, yes, it took me a okay. minute to unmute, but yes, I am here. Perfect. Next slide, please. Uh, wonderful. So uh, we do have um, a report that was put together that accompanies the presentation today and was included in the council packet. And so mostly we'll be speaking to the contents of those rep of that report, including the update on our activity over the past couple of years, as well as uh, recommendations that we'd like to bring forward for the city to consider. Next slide, please. Uh, so the past two years uh, since we last presented uh, at committee night have been uh, extremely busy across the city um, and across the region uh, as it pertains to sustainability. Uh, of course, um, SAC has been highly involved in providing recommendations or reviewing some of these developments. And so over the last couple of years, we've taken a look at, at a number of different stages, the uh, community climate action plan uh, that was developed between all three cities and the region of Waterloo, uh, which included a number of different targets to work towards uh, as a community and a number of action items on how we can begin shifting our local emissions uh, in line with some of the steep changes we need to see to uh, 
uh, keep in line with the, the best science on climate change. Uh, and of course, that's a timely conversation today, given uh, we kicked off uh, now this week, the global climate conference uh, to tackle this at the highest level. Um, and council will recall uh, earlier this year, we, uh, or, uh, SAC put together a report again and a, a presentation uh, urging the adoption of, of the community climate action plan and we're very pleased to see that happen. Uh, similarly, on the transportation master plan, we provided some uh, comments to staff uh, in the engagement process on the development of, this, of the transportation master plan, uh, pointing largely to the need to um, pursue strategies that would reduce uh, auto dependency throughout the city and also wanting to get a sense of how the action items that are laid out in the transportation master plan uh, related to or supported things like the community climate action plan and the targets that were embedded within that. We had worked with uh, staff at the city on uh, recommendations for the development of the corporate co climate action plan, which uh, council will recall was, was one uh, area that uh, was committed to a couple of years ago around the uh, climate emergency declaration to develop this this corporate focus in addition to that community focus work on uh, reducing emissions and so we had provided uh, a bit of commentary to to staff to help guide that process um, we've been really uh, excited to work with some uh, really passionate and committed staff uh, on some work on the energy conservation and demand management plan uh, which is a provincial requirement uh, to have a plan for addressing energy and managing and reporting on energy within the city. Uh, but we are pleased to see, again, moving beyond just the, the core requirements of the legislation, I think staff are taking a very earnest effort to reflect on the need for uh, energy conservation and, and think very carefully about this. Uh, so providing feedback on uh, the development of that plan and also then uh, comments and, and raving concerns where we saw uh, potentially misalignment with things like the corporate climate action plan or questions about how those two things would be aligned and together going forward. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, council uh, approved the update to the green building policy. And so we, we have a subcommittee of uh, SAC who has been working specifically on green buildings um, and has been looking at how we can uh, update this policy again to bring it in line with things like the corporate and community climate action plan and the goals uh, that we need to work with within the design of new space. And again, pleased to hear some really uh, productive conversations with staff who are leading on this file. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've had a number of conversations uh, with, with city staff on how sustainable development goals or the SDGs can be integrated across city planning. This is of course reflected in the city's strategic plan uh, and we're encouraging some of the mapping exercises that have been happening over the past two years and providing some comment and even preliminary mapping exercises ourselves to feed into that process. And uh, on a slightly smaller contribution, um, we had also connected a little bit with staff as the affordable housing strategy has been discussed and wanting to uh, really reflect on the breadth of considerations as to de what determines affordable housing and not just looking at the purchase price of a home, which is uh, clearly important, but also things like the long-term costs of owning a home, energy consumption and efficiency as other considerations, um, how, how uh, accessible that home is to things like public transit or active transportation. And again, the cost implications for people who would be living there uh, one way or the other. And so wanting to encourage that holistic look at uh, how we look at affordable housing. Next slide, please. Uh, and we anticipate a number of these activities continuing over the next year. Uh, so green building policy, the subcommittee will continue to look at uh, the existing policy A33 and, and um, as I mentioned, make sure it's aligned with the corporate and community climate action goals. Essentially, we, we need to stop building buildings that are, are uh, relying on fossil fuel infrastructure uh, if we want to have a chance corporately or community wide to uh, to meet these targets. And so in addition to looking at the corporate policy, also starting to reflect uh, community level building standards, which is a, an action item in the community climate action plan. Uh, we want to continue to support the development of the corporate climate action plan. Um, this is a, a, a major undertaking and um, there is a lot of work happening in the space already on the building side, but ensuring this takes a holistic look at all pillars of 
or all sources, I should say, of emissions uh, within the city's portfolio, including fleet and waste and other uh, scope three action areas. Um, and then we do have a policy review committee that's also starting to look at the uh, city official plan, um, recognizing the importance that this has in long term planning uh, for the city and how it guides policies and programs and actions over uh, quite a long period of time uh, and, and wanting to make sure that there's sustainability content and lenses in that policy language. Next slide. Okay, uh, John here. And uh, first, I want to uh, acknowledge the uh, work the city has done on sustainability over the past and, and continues to undertake now. It's very encouraging to see that uh, the city is engaged uh, so deeply on sustainability. Um, the uh, city council has charged uh, the SAC with uh, taking on a much more holistic vision of sustainability and we're basically under three pillars, social, economic, and environmental lens, uh, and uh, how those three interact. Um, the uh, SAC would also, we'd also like to applaud the city for their commitments uh, that have been made to advance sustainability uh, in the corporation and in the community. Uh, and I think uh, Matt outlined a, a number of those areas uh, in the last slide. Um, but uh, we're uh, looking at uh, major shifts in thinking that need to be made in sustainability to take a uh, even larger step forward. And uh, we would like to raise uh, a few concerns and uh, like to ask Council to consider uh, action and further action that will mobilize uh, and move yet faster on commitments that are, are being made. Um, these uh, concerns are going to touch on five core themes that I will uh, outline in a moment here. Uh, and these Could we get are... Our next slide, please? Oh. There we go. <laughs> yep, uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, the five core themes themes that we're looking at is uh, first is uh, limited resources and uh, so far the city has not uh, really set out a plan to adequately uh, resource the system their sustainability commitments uh, for example we're uh, where they're undertaking actions uh, of the existing energy conservation demand management plan is going to require greater mobilization, uh, which means uh, significant investment to uh, building improvement that's not uh, sufficiently integrated into the capital budget at this point. Uh, we understand that uh, through a couple of previous um, presentations from staff, there has been a roadmap set out that the council has endorsed, um, and there has been uh, some uh, funding released from uh, a uh, reserve fund, but this is sort of piecemeal kind of action. And uh, if we're going to have resource, uh, proper resourcing, um, SAC would uh, strongly urge increasing resources to support action uh, to strategically connect infrastructure investments uh, with a life cycle focused capital uh, planning process. So that sort of means uh, not just allowing things to fail and then uh, replacing like with like, which has limited ability to improve on the efficiency of those systems. Uh, pillar number two is uh, showing greater urgency for uh, climate action and uh, taking the declaration that uh, the city has made uh, more, uh, yes, more seriously, I would say. So uh, at the time of this report, there's only 110 months left till the end of 2030, uh, which is a point at which we've said there should be a 50% reduction in uh, the emissions uh, from uh, the city as a whole. Uh, and the city, uh, we're hoping, can be a leader in that, uh, showing uh, what they're doing uh, and as a uh, signal to the community 
that uh, this is a serious matter. Um, we're now 24 months uh, into the uh, city declaring a climate emergency, and while there has been a commitment to develop a core cap or a corporate uh, climate action plan, uh, there seems to have been limited success or limited progress so far. So it would, that urgency needs to be uh, taken and uh, brought into line uh, quickly. Um, so while SAC acknowledges that some actions have continued in the absence of the core cap, uh, continued delay on the implementation is going to quickly make it uh, difficult to achieve those 2030 targets or even the 30% uh, 2030 targets. Um, for, um, yeah, for example, we've initiated an energy and GHG committee with this, or we understand that the uh, city has in, uh, initiated a energy and GHG committee um, and a sustainability, environmental sustainability team. Um, and we're certainly hoping that those uh, groups will uh, uh, be able to increase the pace at which uh, things are uh, progressing. Um, the other uh, item would be the uh, ECDM, uh, which I believe is uh, two years away from being updated, and it's uh, somewhat out of date now, or maybe I should say woefully out of date, uh, with looking at uh, where we should be uh, going uh, with uh, the corporate uh, buildings at this point to try and get uh, us down to meeting those targets of uh, 50 by 30 and 80 by 50 that we're, uh, the city has committed to. Uh, third pillar would be transparency. Uh, and this is uh, imperative that there's a process that community members can understand how the city's progressing against its stated social, economic, and environmental mental sustainability targets. While there's uh, Qualitative reports provided for progress on the strategic plan, for example, uh, they have not, there has not been included uh, quanti qualitative assessments in key areas like uh, smart, uh, linked to smart targets. Um, so SAC would strongly encourage development of key performance indicators linked to the strategic plan objectives and backed by data to improve the public's understanding of progress against the city's goals. So as an example, I just looked at the uh, reporting on GHG emissions uh, on the city website, and it's uh, simply a table of numbers with uh, no way, uh, well, unless somebody is uh, very familiar with uh, what's gone on and uh, what those numbers mean, there's no uh, real way for the public to understand what what they actually mean. Um, fourth pillar, capacity. Um, so uh, again, concerned that the city doesn't have the capacity to implement. Uh, SAC has worked with some really fantastic staff who are professional in making uh, sincere efforts and tackling difficult challenges. But uh, our understanding of this work has historically fallen on uh, a very few people. And the establishment of a citywide sustainable ability tar, uh, team is uh, long overdue and very encouraging step that, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we hope that additional personnel uh, will support the committee and uh, there will be coordination um, for implementing reporting and continuous improvement in city efforts. Uh, we do understand that facilities has hired two people in the last year or two, uh, and the latest being the energy manager who has done some fantastic work. and. We hope that uh, there can be a uh, larger um, group brought in uh, to a uh, environmental or sustainability kind of team to uh, build out uh, the capacity throughout the city. Uh, finally, uh, looking at uh, alignment and uh, making sure uh, that the there's 
strategic coordination or alignment between the various policies, plans, and strategies, uh, as Matt alluded to in his comments a little earlier, uh, reigns unclear, for example, how the transportation master plan is aligned with the community climate action plan. And despite there being a necessity to see deep emissions reductions from transportation, which is one of the larger emitting areas, uh, we need to see how that aligns with uh, the overall uh, climate targets. Um, so efforts should be made to review all strategies and planning to ensure consistency and alignment. And uh, the SAC would therefore suggest um, it's uh, that every report and or plan brought to council comment on alignment with environment, social, and economic sustainability commitments. So for example, the council reports like this one has uh, three implications that the report might include, which are uh, financial technology and linked to the STRAT plan. And there could possibly be a fourth, which would be their, their link to sustainability, so that every uh, action is looked at through a sustainability lens. And next slide, please. Back over to you, Matt. Thanks. Uh, and I know we're, we're at time, so I'll wrap up really quickly. We, we also recognize the last two years have been particularly challenging with COVID and things have been considerably disrupted in, in almost every regard across the city. So we thank the, the city for continuing to, to move on this. Uh, we, we hope that as we move past the pandemic, uh, that we will be refocusing efforts to address these urgent issues um, and, and tackle challenges like climate change. Um, and again, that SAC is a willing and, and eager partner to help with this development. I believe we will leave it at that. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, John. Um, uh, well, I'll let now look for uh, counselors. Do you have any questions on your uh, presentation? And at this point, I don't see any, but I might turn over to the, oh, I do have a question from Councillor oh, Bonagor for staff. Okay. Um, Let's uh, see if we have any questions for the delegation or comments from Councillor Bodley. Uh, yeah, thank you through uh, through Mayor Jaworski. I really wanted to thank uh, Matt and uh, and John. And uh, it's unfortunate that Lucas couldn't make it because Lucas is such a really great contributor to the to the committee as well too, as are all of the committee members. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I learn a. Uh, I learn a I, I learn a lot every every single time I'm at uh, at SAC and it's uh, it's it's been a, a humbling experience to to be in the presence of so many experts on on the on the various uh, sustainability topics that we run through and uh, it's been a great education for me so I I really do appreciate that and I appreciate the the advocacy for us to continue to 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 move forward and and to do more and um, you guys really sort of highlighted uh, a few of the challenges that we're dealing with when it comes to to climate change as a topic and i think within each of those challenges we could all we could and and you guys alluded to them as well too we could we could highlight some of the some of the progress that we've made whether that's uh from a resourcing perspective and a capacity perspective in terms of have hiring uh scott as a corporate energy manager who's done such incredible work for us even just in the last couple of months um or whether it's the work that we've done on transform wr or the uh platinum uh, certification that we've received from the world city council on data um to to try and help us develop some of those kpis that you guys are advocating for uh that the team is advocating for and so i know there's a lot of work that's that's gone into it from a staff perspective and a lot more work that needs to happen and uh you you certainly have my commitment as a counselor that that climate change and and the work that the sustainability advisory committee is doing and that staff are doing to tackle this issue uh uh, are will continue to be top priorities uh, from my perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bodley, and uh, to to Matt and to John. I, I see no further questions, so I'll let you two uh, drop up. But you probably want to listen to Councillor uh, Bonagore's question, but it's uh, solely for staff. Uh, Councillor Bonagore, over to you. Thank you, and through you, Major Worski. I, I was just 
I uh, wanted to ask staff about that, that first point of concern that the committee members brought up, um, you know, about resources when dealing with climate change, particularly their comment of, you know, not waiting for things to fail and then replace them with like for like. I, I know we discussed this at our recent meeting with the green facilities plans. I just wanted to check in with the facilities team that you feel like we've given you enough in order to take a more strategic approach to plan out future needs and make smarter, better decisions as we move forward, as opposed to just waiting for things to fail and then getting the next one off the shelf. And I'm going to go to Commissioner Dykstra, who's here as acting CAO, and perhaps uh, to either answer or redirect the question. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, uh, uh, to Councillor uh, Bonagore. So uh, reflecting on the same, when I heard that uh, comment, and I do feel we've received the uh, direction from Council per the uh, previous meeting that we had both uh, Director Siva and Scott Provost at, and uh, as well as uh, Kevin Van Odegum. So I feel we have what we need. It's now uh, working uh, the, uh, the next budget process. And hearing that uh, directive and he, he, even hearing uh, today's commentary to uh, put things into action. So we've got the uh, direction I feel we need to do and uh, we'll return with uh, what we need to fulfill uh, next steps. So stay tuned on, in that regard. Trust that assist, Councillor Bonagar. It does, thank you very much. Thank you, May, that was all. Thank you. Uh, with that, we move on to item C, the Waterloo Economic Development Advisory Committee annual report, and uh, Mike Pereira, the chair, is here to present. Thank you, Mayor Jaworski. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm good, Mike. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, as was said, I'm going to present on uh, the Waterloo Economic Development Advisory Committee or as we call it, WEDAC. Uh, basically, I've broken this into three short sections around who we are and what we're doing, what we've done to date, and what we're hoping to do as we go forward. Uh, next slide, please. So WEDAC, or the Waterloo Economic Development Advisory Committee, uh, really exists to advise council and staff on matters about specifically the city's economic development program and strategy, uh, but also to be a resource um, for anything related to the to the idea of economic development projects and initiatives within the city and to sort of act as a conduit or interaction point between the business community and the academic community and the city staff and council. Next slide. Uh, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the contributions of the members of the committee. Um, Art Sinclair representing the Greater Chamber of Commerce, Blaine Gray, Beth Palmer from the University of Waterloo, uh, Will Du, Darren Snyder, uh, Dave Werzak, the Vice Chair of the Committee along with myself, uh, who's also on the call today, Yannick uh, Jedielowitz, J.S. Balaskanthan, Madison Cox representing Wilfrid Laurier University, Michelle Grimes from Conestoga College, myself, Mike Pupolo for representing the KW Home Builders, Slobodan Markovic, Tom Diavolitsis, Zach Weston, uh, our student resource, Matthew Nicholas Schwartz, and then from the city, uh, Mayor Jaworski, Councillor Bodley, Councillor Vaith, Tim Anderson, Justin McFadden, and Nancy Gale. Uh, I think it's important for us to recognize the contributions of all these great people who spend a lot of time <laughs> on this committee. Next slide. Uh, so what we've done uh, to this point in 2020, 2021, uh, of course, a main uh, matter that we've reviewed has been the COVID-19 response, uh, particularly around approving the CIP uh, and how find, looking at ways we can support local businesses uh, and the local sec tech sector recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Uh, a few other areas we've looked into have been challenges faced by local PPE manufacturers or personal protective equipment. A number of companies in the community pivoted uh, to manufacturing PPE uh, during the pandemic, uh, but have continued to struggle uh, as they've tried to grow. So we've heard updates from Tony Lamentia at Waterloo EDC and the Ian McLean at the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce. We've also been doing a number uh, looking into the affordable housing crisis here in Waterloo Region. Uh, we've had presentations uh, from staff at WEDAC, as well as participating in the research and innovation and housing uh, event hosted by the city. 
Um, we recognize that this is an issue that is of critical importance to economic development and economic success, success in the city. So we're continuing to dive deeper into how we can uh, support on that issue. Next slide. We've done quite a bit of work on the west side employment lands, particularly forming a subcommittee around branding of the lands to help with marketability. Um, we've also been advising on the former Krauss lands process uh, and look forward to um, the announcement of when we'll be able to see what's going to happen on those lands in the future. We're going to be forming a subcommittee as well on the city's official plan review, hoping to weigh in on areas that are germane to economic development, uh, which I'll get into a little bit further down. Next slide. And then these are just a number of other areas we've been looking at. Uh, the Chamber's physician recruitment efforts. Again, healthcare is a really key pillar of our ability to attract and retain talent uh, for the companies looking to grow in the region. The Uptown Waterloo Vision Committee. Uh, we've been looking at how we can support the film and, develop, uh, film and television sector in their growth. Um, we heard presentations from Air Matrix and helped to bring forward a pilot project within the research park. And we've uh, the committee's also been uh, helping a little bit on the strategic planning for the future of the David Johnson Research and Technology Park at the University of Waterloo. We heard from Catherine Fife on her Bill 275 regarding supply chain diversity and government procurement. We've heard from arts and culture as well as tourism on how we can support the recovery in those sectors. Looked at funding requests from Communitech as well as working with Laurier on their vision for the new Faculty of Music uh, space and the University Gateway project. Next slide. So where we're going in the future here, uh, we're really focused on three key areas as part of the city strategic plan, economic growth and development, infrastructure renewal, and equity inclusion and a sense of belonging. Next slide. So, what we're doing in each of those areas is sort of as follows. Under growth and development, we're going to continue to look at the development of the West Side employment lands and other city owned lands and how we can best leverage those for the economic success of the city. We're going to have continued input on the proposed changes of the city's official plan, uh, as well as input on proposed expenditures from the Economic Development Reserve Fund. Related to infrastructure renewal, uh, we'll be looking at final input on the revised development charges bylaw and continuing to support for the uh, city's Brownfield TIG program. Next slide. Regarding equity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging, uh, this is an area the committee has felt a strong sense of, uh, we need to bring stronger ties between the vision of economic development and other areas within what the city is hoping to achieve in terms of building a thriving community. So we're gonna continue to engage with city staff around affordable housing initiatives, we want to leverage the collective network of the committee to help drive investment from the community into investments that benefit the community. An example of this is the Wilfrid Laurier's Making Space for Music campaign to enhance arts and culture and expand creative industry within the city. We want to continue to investigate and encourage behaviors within businesses around giving back. How can we incubate young companies to grow, to have a sense of social responsibility and have deeper roots within making this community a place where everyone thrives? Uh, and lastly, we want to work together with the city to help how, do a better job of selling ourselves as a great place to live, go to school, work, or open a business. Uh, next slide. So WEDAC identified a number of key themes or topics that, while not strictly under the purview of economic development as a department, are critically linked to economic development in terms of creating a thriving city. Uh, those are innovation and a thriving business community, response to climate change through resiliency and adaptation, uh, which we've heard a lot about through the previous presentation, reconciliation with Indigenous communities, an equitable and inclusive community for all, affordable and accessible housing and childcare, health and well-being, including and especially mental health, and active and public transportation. All of these things are really important to building a thriving city and that makes them key to our economic development strategy. Next slide. So for our next steps, uh, immediately, we're going to be kicking off a subcommittee on the official plan review, working together with the city to see what key areas we can help advise on. Uh, we're going to continue our research and investigation into matters such as affordable housing and childcare and other things to remain to economic development, including possibly forming additional subcommittees as needed. And we're going to be seeking out additional opportunities to engage and advise with staff and council on matters important to the city's economic development and growth.
Next slide. That's uh, the update for me. I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mike. And I'll just look uh, to counselors for hands to go up virtually. And seeing none at this time, I might call upon either Councillor Bodley or and Councillor Veith, who serve with me on this committee, or both, to see if they want to offer any uh, closing comments. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Veith. Uh, through you, Mayor Jaworski. Thank you, Mike, for today and for your dedication to this committee. It's always, um, always interesting every every meeting, and. Um, and I also want to thank the rest of the committee for uh, their dedication and showing up at eight o'clock in the morning for a two hour uh, get together and uh, for all the work that everybody does. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Veith. And I certainly uh, would speak on behalf of Councillor Bodley that I certainly appreciate the, uh, the round table that we have uh, as the committee members you highlighted in your presentation, Mike, you know, just such a, a good um, uh, rounding out of uh, a number of areas of the community so we can get the, the uh, feedback to uh, Justin McFadden's team and to members of council on what's uh, the finger on the pulse of what's going on, particularly as we everybody struggles through COVID-19, the pandemic, and as we look to come out of it uh, positively. So with that, thank you very much, uh, Mike, and I'm not sure if Dave's there with you, but uh, thank you and thank you for any uh, Committee members listening in. Thanks so much. And uh, with that, uh, we've concluded our area of uh, the council meeting where we're hearing from our committees. And we move on to item D, which is the proposed 2022 council schedule, a uh, report prepared for us, calendar prepared for us by uh, Julie Scott. And I'll just pause to see if there's any questions on item D. And I would note uh, to thank uh, uh, council members for, uh, uh, for for being excited about coming back to uh, chairing meetings. I think that's something that uh, I think we all look forward to a time when we can actually see each other and be in the council chambers. Um, but in the meantime, we can be in a nice rotational schedule that allows everybody to uh, take, uh, take controls, shall we say, but uh, gavel free for the time being. Seeing no Questions, I'll look to award one more to to consider this motion. Councillor Hanmer, I'm happy to make the motion to accept report C, uh, Corp 2021 042, and I vote in favor. Councillor Bodley, I will second the motion and vote in favor. Councillor Veith, in favor. Councillor Freeman, in favor. Councillor Henry, in favour? Councillor Bonigo, in favour. And the mayor's in favour too. That carries unanimously, so it'll be good to have that new council schedule for this. And um, as I look back uh, with Julie here on items A, B and C, um, they actually did have recommendations for them because they were staff reports. And I'm wondering if uh, Councillor, uh, Ward 1, Ward 2 would take us forward moving acceptance of the three reports A, B, C from the three committees that had reports and to uh, and to vote for them. It's Councillor Hanmer. I move acceptance of the reports attached with items A, B, and C in the staff reports and I vote in favour. Councillor Bodley, I'll second uh, the motion and vote in favour. Councillor Veith, in favour. Councillor Freeman, in favour. Councillor Henry, in favour. Councillor Bonagor, in favour. And the mayor's in favour too. That carries by all of us. Moving on to item E is the regular regional road maintenance agreement uh, prepared by Christine Keeler and Susan Bolt. Uh, does anybody have any questions on that? Uh, seeing none, uh, um, for convenience sake, I'll look for Ward 1, Ward 2 to take us forward again. 
uh, Councillor Hanmer, I move acceptance of the report on the regional road maintenance agreement and vote in favor. Councillor Bodley loves seconding things. We'll do so again and vote in favor. Councillor Veith in favor. Councillor Freeman in favor. Councillor Henry in favor. Councillor Bonagore in favor. And I'm in favor too. That carries unanimously. Thank you very much to the transportation team for the work with the region. Um, moving on to item 12, uh, moving on to item 13, and it's a notice of motion properly filed, so we don't need to waive from Council Henry on paid on street parking for the Northdale area. I will turn it over to Ward Councilor Henry. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, bring this forward and um, hopefully, uh, with Council's blessing, launch a, a review and a process. Um, I, I think there's there's a couple of things to be uh, to be said. You know, here we, we've heard today from our sustainability uh, advisory committee about the need to accelerate actions. Certainly, we've identified through uh, a, br a broad range of policy documents, the need to uh, a take uh, take serious and meaningful uh, climate action, particularly against uh, transportation emissions, which make up about half of our our local emissions. We've made commitments around um, de-emphasizing you know driving and emphasizing active transportation uses. This is particularly true in policy documents that. Previous councils have developed and subsequent councils have moved on in the Northdale area specifically to create a sustainable neighborhood that is focused on active transportation and not vehicular transportation. Uh, and of course, our transportation master plan speaks to uh, the increasing challenges at the curbside of managing all of the different demands and the conflicts that arise from that, and as well the need to, uh, to be able to shift our infrastructure uh, to be a more balanced way that, that recognizes all modes of transportation and that we, we take seriously and plan specifically around active transportation uh, and public transportation movement and, and uses. So in that spirit, um, I believe the time has has come for us to take a, a serious look at, um, at public space uh, for private purposes and whether that, use, whether that use for parking should be free or not be free. In the area around Northdale, uh, given the policy um, uh, that we've we've come forward with over the years and the objectives and the goals, uh, I think that is a no-brainer. The scope and scale, the what's and how's of of how we would do uh, paid on street parking uh, is something that I'm very interested in understanding more of from from staff and the community through a detailed um, uh, a detailed consultation process and. It made sense to me in, in consultation with my neighboring ward councillor, uh, Councillor Bonagore, that areas the city had previously considered uh, over a decade ago, um, you know, south of uh, south of Laurier, uh, would also be uh, worthwhile reviewing uh, at the same time. Uh, doesn't mean that that's where we're going to end up. Uh, uh, I, uh, I'll speak for the north side of University Avenue, and I look forward to the conversation ahead. Uh, but I think it's important for us to to take a strong look at. Uh, uh, at shifting that responsibility in areas that are incredibly well served by active transportation infrastructure that is connected, that is close to destinations, and in areas where all where developments and institutions are required to be managing their their parking demand on their own sites and not having them spill over into uh, into public spaces. So I think the time is right for us to take a look at paid on street parking. I think Northdale and and similar nearby uh, areas are worth. Um, Having that be our first place to to look, and that this is an opportunity for us to talk more with uh, uh, with people about this, understand what a program could look like, and then for for that to come back to council for uh, for some final decisions. So, with that, Mayor, I, I'd be happy to put it on the on the floor and and to move that that motion and 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 look for a seconder and invite any question or or comment from council. Very sensible. I'll look to see if. Uh... Anybody who has uh, enthusiasm for Councilor Henry's motion? Don't, don't all jump at once. I'm happy to second it. It's Councilor Freeman. 
Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Uh, with that, now we have a motion properly moved on the table. Does, uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, Councillor Henry or on this topic of staff? Uh, Councillor Monagor, please go ahead. Kelsey, please. Uh, thank you through you, Mayor Jaworski. Um, so when this motion came forward, it's, I mean, it's obviously gives a lot to think about. And I've been hearing a lot from residents um, south of university. But, you know, like, I just want to make some comments to kind of lead you through my thinking for right now. And I've got a couple of questions for staff towards the end. So, I mean, it's, it's quite clear that we need to help people choose something other than a car. And, you know, perhaps paid parking is, is going to be the thing that helps do that um, by making individual drivers kind of pay for part of the cost of their choice to drive. So this motion, you know, it speaks directly to the parking requirements that are generated by the universities. And as Councillor Henry pointed out, this is an area that is richly served, not just by AT infrastructure, but, you know, public transit um, is, is fantastic in this area. The, the motion does, does raise a number of questions um, for my ward in particular, you know, it's kind of these big amorphous ones, you know, should Ezra, Bricker and Clayfield be treated as city streets or as an extension of the university campus? You know, are there ways that universities could play a bigger role or to be held more accountable for the parking that they're currently generating? And, you know, are there other tools such as, you know, some residents suggested like no parking areas or permit parking that could deliver the same results or tackle the same issues um, in these areas abutting the university zone. So these are just kind of the ideas that have been running through my head. Um, now, a number of residents, particularly in the McGregor Albert community, they're very concerned that introducing paid parking on you know, Ezra, Bricker and Clayfield would simply move those parking problems directly into their neighbourhood, potentially across the street to Uptown North which would then potentially make it even harder for bylaw to enforce the rules we have. So, you know, should this motion gain council's approval and should this go to towards getting a, a report and a review? These are some of the issues that at least constituents in my ward would, would need to have addressed and they would need some answers to, the, to those questions. Um, but I have a, a couple of questions of staff if I may, you know, we're talking about the, the issue of parking in the university areas. Like, do we already have bylaw tools to combat this? And if so, what's preventing us from using them? Okay, we'll just see who from staff can take that. It's Nicole Popka, uh, Mayor Jaworski. Oh, hi, Nicole. Hi, I can speak to it a little bit. I think typically um, we can respond to complaints for three hour. Um, and I think that's typically what has been happening in terms of enforcement in the area. But most of most often three hour um, are complaints based in residential areas. So, okay, thank you, um, Ms. Papke. So just so I'm understanding, um, Councillor Henry is telling us this is an ongoing intractable problem, but the city's not doing, is not able to do proactive enforcement of this area, even though it's a known problem. Is that correct? Through you, Chair uh, Mayor Jaworski, um, I think proactive can be done, but typically hasn't been done. It's been a complaints based for three hour parking in the area. And is there a reason that we aren't doing proactive? Is it just simply the, the sheer number of things that bylaw officers are responsible for right now, and this is one of them? 
um, or because uh, I know we've got bylaw that kind of patrols the uptown lots. I'm just wondering what the difference is if we have known problem areas. Um, through you, Mayor Jaworski, we would definitely um, enforce on a proactive basis if there were significant complaints in the area, and I can certainly follow back up um, with Council on, on that in terms of what complaints we've received. And we are sort of ramping up parking again um, post, post, you know, now that more students are back in town, more more people are parking again um, in the core, um, just in terms of the three hour and everybody having the opportunity to be able to park. Okay, thank you. Um, my other questions really, uh, given the complexity of, of this specific pocket of the city with McGregor Albert in particular, um, is it possible for the review to investigate different approaches in different areas uh, or are you looking for a, a one tool to solve them all essentially? Is that question for me uh, through you Mayor Jaworski? Uh, through you Mayor, it would be for whoever would be charged with doing this review, should it, should it go ahead? I think it would be a, um, a multi-departmental review, so we could certainly take all of those um, things into consideration in terms of assessing what needs are um, required in the specific areas. Okay, so there's capacity for different approaches in different different neighbourhoods depending on what the review lays out. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Jaworski, it looks like um, the direction is for staff to consider different approaches and management strategies um, in terms of coming up with a program design. So I would say yes, there would be definitely um, a lot of considerations. Yeah, and I would say to Councillor Bonagor, we have to remember this is a, a, a politically driven, council driven initiative at this point. And until we make a decision, there's 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 been no particular effort by staff in this regard. But uh, you're, you're certainly some of your questions like three hour parking do stand, of course. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, and I'm not saying staff are doing anything wrong. It's just like maybe like whether there's something that might be um, worth considering supplemental to a motion like this is kind of where I was getting that with with my my questions there. Um, and, and I just have one bigger, broader question for, for staff is, is this is a, a motion very much directed at uh, the university areas and specific challenges that have arisen from the, the parking demand there. Do you see, given your experience of the, the city streets and transportation network in, as a whole, do you concur that this is one specific area that does need a tailored solution? Or should we down the road be looking for like a wider, more systemic review to kind of untangle that knot of parking and transit in the age of climate change? Uh, through you, Mayor Jaworski, it's, it's Nicole again. I certainly think probably there should be a strategy or considered a strategy uh, to look at citywide approaches um, for for traffic management and, and certainly um, um, other options that could could assist in, in, in the direction that council would like staff to go. Um, yeah, did, like, does that mean that, that, that this, okay, uh, that, that'll do for me. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think you, you have some good forward looking thinking, um, uh, that, that raise good questions about how we want to tackle, uh, climate change and where it all fits in. I think, uh, it's, it's, it's bit, um, I'd like to thank Nicole for her, uh, for her quick thinking on this one too. Um, and, and that is very good. Um, I do have a question. Of, well, I see Councillor Henry has a comment, but I'll ask my question. It's it's to the uh, to the mover. 
Uh, just on the uh, point, the council directs staff to include uh, directing net proceeds from the program uh, into further enhancing active transportation network in these neighborhood areas, which sounds uh, uh, sounds uh, good, and uh, so does the uh, the entire motion for that matter. Um, I'm just wondering. I'm sure you've given thought to the fact that uh, uh, bylaw is a, is an enterprise and uh, how that um, all works out. That typically um, this this money is already accounted for as an enterprise as opposed to it paying it out to uh, transportation. And just wanted to get your thoughts on that, and I'll let you do your comment as well, Councillor Henry. And uh, sure, Mayor, appreciate the uh, uh, the opportunity uh, on that. Um, uh, I think that's not entirely true. Uh, we uh, in in Uptown, when we uh, provided for paid extended off street parking um, uh, through through Honk, Honk had uh, net proceeds uh, uh, coming to it, which we absorbed into the operating budget, the general operating budget of the city. Um, so it's not exclusively true uh, in ah, terms good. of uh, in terms of how that uh, how that could work. And so how you know which expenses are in, which expenses are not. Um, municipal enforcement uh, you know, staff have you know reminded me, which which I which I knew that uh, many of the sort of enforcement you know officers are are paid out of revenue uh, for uh, for those. Um, uh, for those activities. So is the act of ticketing someone not in compliance with the bylaw in the program or out of the program? Is the program just the additional revenue from from payments for on street parking? And violation revenue is is the standard, you know, municipal enforcement ticket revenue. So I think there are good questions on financial model that, that needs to sort of be set out. But it would seem to me that um, you know this is not something that would generate less revenue, but something that would generate more revenue. Uh, and and those parts that are part of the program and not generally part of you know the ongoing enterprise uh, um, you know would probably generate some net revenue here and it would be useful for for those to benefit the neighborhood as a whole in addition to uh, achieving the goals that that we have in the neighborhood and and for the broader community. I, I even floated you know with uh, with finance uh, that there could be some opportunity. Uh, to look at uh, participatory budgeting, you know, approaches on on what to do with with sort of net revenues once we had a handle on it. There there are many ways to sort of tackle that, uh, but I did want to signal up front that I, I think that you know net proceeds from this should be you know directed and uh, directed back into uh, into the community to help achieve those goals and make it easier for people that are paying into it to make different choices, which is ultimately the objective. Um, uh, so hopefully that yeah. responds to the that, question. That is yeah, that is really, really, really good. And just reminding me the difference of uh, overtime parking versus, you know, our, our paid parking in our lots and having to look after our own lots from paid parking. So very, very good. Thank you for that. Yeah, and 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 I think uh, the, the, the couple of comments that I would make arising from comments of from from my neighboring counselor. Um, one, uh, yes, this is in, in areas that are surrounded by post-secondary institutions. That's certainly part of the on-street. Uh, demand. The other thing um, that I would I, I would suggest is you know we have um, significant private uh, development certainly in Northdale and also over time and on on Ezra and and, and at Bricker um, that is responsible for their for, for their own parking for their own building and you know I, I certainly believe from what I know on the Northdale side that there is spillover coming from those those private units they are charging for parking. Um, and they have vacant parking, but there is people parking in front of them. And I get complaints from time to time from folks that say, but I parked on the street for this building and I was here overnight. And then you ticketed me in the morning because I was here for too long. So there is a tap, there is parking that comes with these buildings that isn't necessarily uh, happening on those buildings, which they're supposed to, and which were part of comments through the development process from our transportation group that they're supposed to manage. So. I think there's all sorts of spillover that happens in here, uh, and uh, and and you know folks are trying to avoid paying for for parking uh, connected with their you know with their unit by parking on you know public streets. That's not the that's not why we have public streets, and that's not why we have uh, our, our parking strategies around there. And so this is one mechanism to deal with that. Um, but the other suggestion I I just sort of have is if there are significant concerns about you know. The relatively narrow focus of, of what I have on 
on this motion as it might pertain to MACA, I am perfectly happy to strip out um, Berkeley Clayfield and Ezra and let a separate process initiated at a separate time or uh, at the same time that fits the parameters that uh, Councillor Bonagore is interested in to, to be developed there and not have that bundled in, if that would be helpful, because you know, I don't want to have something that feels like you know, a, a solution in one space needs to be the solution in the other space if if really the, the, the goal in the other space is to look at four or five different things. So I would offer that. And if that is uh, of, of interest, I'm happy for that to be the motion instead. Okay, so uh, the the offer on the table is to circumscribe this to essentially Northdale only, north of the university, because I know you didn't mention Leicester and, Leicester and Sunview, which are sort of nearby Mac, but not really. So let's uh, let's go to uh, Ward 7 Councillor and uh, check for thoughts. Um, through you, Major Worski, I think that might, I was, to be honest, I was going to ask for the, the if the report could come back with two options. One would be with and one would be without the, the MACA streets. So um, it could come down to staff capacity. Uh, if, if we want to move more quickly on this, um, then Councillor Henry's suggestion may be a, a good one because there, there would need to be some pretty deep engagement with the, the residents in the, the neighbourhood south of university. Um, so yeah. I could look to staff on, on their capacity oh. or we could just make that decision. I, I, think, I think what I'd, I'd prefer is, uh, or what I'm going to suggest, is that we uh, circumscribe it strictly to Northdale because we know that's a known entity with um, um, uh, a consultation level that is uh, much different than the MACA concert, uh, consultation. And then we can use uh, what we discover in this one, um, perhaps over time, whether it be in six months or a year and a half or something like that, to then bring this uh, solution with some additions to it to the uh, to, towards seven. That would be my suggestion, just so we can uh, circumscribe it a bit and make it uh, uh, an easier bite to swallow. As always, Mayor, you are extremely wise. That sounds good to me. As always, wow, that's a, that's an impressive. That's a high end. <laughs> Yeah, so it will now, uh, to Councillor Henry, uh, your motion will be for paid on-street parking in Northdale in consultation with area residents, including students. Is that sensible? And that was to Councillor Henry. Sorry, I thought you were confirming with the, with, with the clerk. Um, oh, oh, yeah, no, that's, oh, no, that, that was my that, cool. that okay. was my offer based on hearing Councillor Bonagore's comments today, uh, and 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 so um, that's that's fine. And as a with area residents, that includes all the other words that come after that. You, you just betcha. sort of cut off your recitation. Yeah, I, I did. Um, and so with that, I'll just check for Councillor Freeman, who I'm sure is okay with that. Yes, thank you. Okay, and with that, let's uh, see no further comments. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll vote and uh, begin with uh, Councillor Henry. Councillor Henry in favor of the revised motion. Councillor Bonagore in favor. Councillor Hanmer in favor. Councillor Bodley in favor. Councillor Veith in favor. Councillor Freeman in favor. And the mayor is in favor too. Thank you very much, Councillor Henry. I know you've given a lot of thought to this over the years, and uh, I think it's something that uh, time has certainly come. And uh, thank you to Nicole for for weighing in on our on our questions. And uh, thank you very much to the team for looking into this for um, for all of council. So with that, uh, we move on to questions. Does anyone have any? questions for staff they want to put on the table. Uh, it's Councillor Freeman. I had a question. Oh, please go ahead. Um, my question was, how are neighborhoods named? <laughs> and um, there has been some conversation about some neighborhoods 
and that they maybe make more reference to our colonial past. And so I just didn't know how neighborhoods got named and whether or not the city plays a role in that or whether over time real estate agents name neighborhoods. I, I just really don't know. I'm going to ask Commissioner Dykstra to probably redirect that. I don't think Joel is here today. No, um, but uh, I just have to be a question that requires an answer later. Go, go ahead, Commissioner. Yep, thank you, uh, Mayor to Councillor Freeman. Yes, uh, uh, two parts, sort of uh, uh, developer uh, uh, part of that. Uh, it's a really a planning process, so developer uh, and also staff with some uh, district planning and consensus on that. So there's a, a reference to both uh, over the history. I recall from uh, seeing uh, you know, different plans of subdivision coming forward. We can take it uh, away and uh, clarify further for uh, council uh, as needed. I know this is a, has been a, a topic of discussion that we've uh, chatted uh, with Sanjay and just uh, seeing in our neighborhood group to see uh, uh, where we need to go in the future in this manner. Uh, thank you. It, I don't want it to be a make work project, but if 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 the equity and diversity team um, is already looking at it, then maybe that's something that um, that we can hear about later. Noted. Thank you, Councillor Freeman. Excellent. Um, I see no further uh, questions, and we'll move on to do business. And uh, you'll see here at uh, from Launchpad Brands, uh, a by the glass application that the city support the issuance of the manufacturer's limited liquor sales license by the glass to Launchpad Brands, subject to compliance with zoning and other applicable law. And this is something I think is up in Councillor Freeman's ward, if I recall. Um, it's it's really a way of stick handling it to help a business out, and that's uh, that's what we have here today. Um, does anybody have any questions on this item? And if not, I'll, I'll go to the ward counselor to consider. We, we want to move this, right? Yeah. To, yeah. to move this. Yeah, I'm happy to move the motion and vote in favor. Thank you. So, and yeah, also Henry, uh, happy to second and vote in favor. And Councillor Bonagor in favour. Councillor Hanmer in favour. Councillor Bodley in favour. Councillor Beath in favour. And the mayor's in favour too. That passes unanimously. Thank you very much for that. And while I have Councillor Freeman on the line, a hearty congratulations on the official announcement of being named the honorary Lieutenant Colonel for. 31 Combat Engineer Regiment, the Elgins. Uh, that is a real um, a notoriety, a real honor, I'm sure, in particular with, uh, you know, I think it's the perhaps the first civilian uh, and resident of the city of Waterloo to hold this role in the uh, 31 Combat en Engineer Re uh, Regiment. Sorry I couldn't join you for the official turnover uh, the other Sunday. Um, but, uh, you know, just a, a hearty congratulations on behalf of council and staff here at the City of Waterloo um, for this. Um, you know, just uh, I'm sure it's a, it was a special, it's a special time for you, uh, Diane. Um, thank you so much, Mayor and council and staff. I know that everyone's really supportive. I appreciate it. Um, certainly we missed your presence and we were sad for the reason that you missed us. So you were in everyone's thoughts. Well, thank, and thank you for that too. Um, does anybody else have any new business? Hearing none, uh, we do have a couple of uh, bylaws to enact. So I'll uh, ask Ward 1, Ward 2 to consider enacting some bylaws for us. Councillor Hanmer, I approve the bylaws and vote in favour. Councillor Bodley, I'll second the bylaws and vote in favour. Councillor Veith in favour. Councillor Freeman in favour. Councillor Henry in favour. Councillor Bonagor in favour. And the mayor's in favour too. That carries unanimously. A uh, note to all our viewers, uh, just noting that 
uh, we will continue on uh, going back in camera to finish off our previously uh, started uh, in camera closed session. And uh, with that, for the open session, we need to adjourn that part of it and then uh, join up the, uh, together immediately thereafter on this line. Oh, yeah, there's a new invitation for that one, gang. So with that, uh, a motion to adjourn Ward 1, Ward 2, please. Councillor Hanmer, I move that we adjourn, and I vote in favour. Councillor Bodley seconds adjournment and votes in favour. Councillor Veith in favour. Councillor Freeman in favour. Councillor Henry in favour. Councillor Bonagore in favour. And the mayor's in favor too. We stand adjourned from our public meeting. Thank you.